Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hi, it's Esther. Sarah isn't with us today. But I have a wonderful guest, Serena, who I first met at St. Luke's Hospital here in San Francisco, which is a place where um, the residents of San Francisco, if they want to have a midwifery-centered childbirth experience, uh, can go. And Serena has since uh, been doing lots of other things, and we wanted to have her on the show to talk about all of that. So I'm going to let her reintroduce herself properly and take off like a rocket. Awesome. Thank you so much. So it's Serena Saeed Wynn. Right. Yes. That's the the full title. Uh, So yeah, we first met. CNN. Yes, CNM, um, women's health nurse practitioner, Mm -hmm. mother of three, have many titles. Sewer, seamstress, I also sew. Yeah, oh. something else that I love to do. Um, but yes, we did first meet uh, at St. Luke's. And before that, I had worked in a birth center setting. I'd done some home birth. Mm-hmm. And I also worked in a nonprofit sector for a little mm-hmm. while at Home as Prenatal. Oh, yeah. Home as Prenatal. Great. Yeah. It's a yeah. wonderful place. I love that Amazing. place. Yeah. I still do work with them like on a volunteer basis just because I'm so passionate about that place. Like it's mm-hmm. just an most amazing, wonderful. Um, and it, it definitely changed kind of my perspective on a lot of things. So yeah, I, I did that for, for many years. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just note that, um, often my clients come home from the hospital, uh, and or home and have a lot of leftover oh, stuff yeah. Yeah. from the birth. And I always gather it up, um, when they're done with it and, Take it over to homeless prenatal. Oh, that's so great, and they so, have a wonderful kind of sharing program there. So. Absolutely, and they run classes, right? So they run classes once a week, and then a lot of times they'll give away that stuff, especially mm-hmm. if it's new, really nice stuff. Yeah, and then they'll give that, and then they have a huge baby shower at the end of the series of classes, mm-hmm. and they give a lot of that stuff away. Yeah. So keep donating. Yes, yes, new, new and nice stuff, especially for the baby shower because it's really fun, and for some people, it's the only baby shower that they'll have is oh, this right. one at homeless prenatal. Yeah. And it's, it's a really beautiful and nice experience. It's so nice that you do that. I didn't know that you did that. That's really cute. Yeah. It was easy to do. You know, yeah. I'm already yeah. in their homes and yeah. Yeah. it saves them a trip. Totally. So that's yeah. great. That's so great that you do that. Um, so yeah, I, I worked there for a while and then I went to do midwifery uh, at St. Luke's and I was a full scope midwife. So I did everything from GYN care to delivering babies to postpartum care. And then I had twins. So I have one seven-year-old amazing child. And then I have twin two-year-olds who are also just as amazing and wonderful. Um, But I, you know, when the twins were six months, I went back to work, but I was still breastfeeding because I exclusively breastfed my twins the whole time. Wow. So I was like doing call, which is I do, I did 12 hours, sometimes 14 hour shifts and I'd be like pumping. And, and then my husband's a fireman. So he works 24 hour shifts. So between the two of us, you know, the time between like when they were six months, when I went back to work to the time I finally decided to leave like nine months later was just crazy. I got mastitis twice. Like it was just nuts. Anyways, I just decided the universe is telling me I need to take a break and focus on my family a little bit. And that's what I've done. I left in January of 2017 and making the transition from being a midwife and working with moms to staying home and being 
just a mom, like a full-time mom, which yeah. is so much just. work. Not yeah. just, it's so much work, right? Yeah. But what I started to find is that the identity of mom was overtaking every other part of myself, right? So I had no kind of that adult conversation that you get when you go to work, right? Mm-hmm. I had none of that except for with my friends, but a lot of my friends, like they work nine to five. Right. Yeah. So when do you get a chance to talk? Yeah. And then by the time, like it's time for me to like talk on the phone, then my kids have a full meltdown. It's like, they have some weird sense. They're like, wait, is mom on the phone? Hold on. Everybody quickly Cry. meltdown, meltdown, everybody. Um, it's a real phenomenon. I think every mom knows that, that the minute you try to do something that's like not related to your child, kids like can't handle it. Anyways. So I just started to find that like my sense of self was starting to kind of go away a little bit. Yeah. So I decided to create this program called Mommy Mental, which I'm super excited about. Um, it's two parts. So The first part is I teach a preparing for postpartum class, which I know it's such a good class. And, you know, it's so funny because the first class I taught, I was like, oh gosh, I hope this goes well. And then while I was teaching it, I was like, God, I wish I'd known this stuff. I was like, I'm teaching the class, but it's true. And I think that, you know, um, in the same way that our society, right, does all this planning for weddings, right? So it's like the wedding, the wedding, and it's like everything has to be heard for the wedding. So you spend all the time focusing, but then you forget that like, guess what? After the wedding, you're married, right? Like that's a thing that you have to do. And that's actually the longest. And, and nobody told thing. you how. Yeah. Right. There wasn't like magazines on like how to be right married and all that stuff. No. So I feel like it's the same thing happens with pregnancy, right? There's all this hype for labor and it's important. It's important to prepare for your labor, of course. Right. But it's almost like if you don't prepare for the postpartum time, it's almost like planning your wedding and then like forgetting to check in on your relationship, the same type of thing. So that's why I decided to create this class. And I, in the class, I actually, my entire framework, everything from the newborn care to postpartum care is all framed around how is the experience for the parents, right? So even the newborn care part that I do, it's not just like, this is exactly how you swaddle. Cause I think all of us know, right? There's no right way. We just figure it out. Everyone has a different thing. And like, now I have three kids. So I realized before I thought it was like all about the parents and like, I got an amazing child the first time. So I'm like, Oh, I'm such a perfect parent. It's all <laughs> me. But now that I have three, I realize like, Oh, kids are just born with their own personalities. Right. Yeah. And we do our best to like foster those and try to, you know, figure out like what's the best way to work in their personality. But in the end, you just kind of have to figure out how to get by. So I yeah. think it's silly to think that there's like one right way to do things. Right. Yeah. And your instinct as a parent is as valid as anyone else's. Absolutely. I mean, I, my, my wonderful mother came and was trying in the first three days that she only had three days she could managed to spend with me mm. but she was gonna show me how to swaddle Susie she really felt right. like it would be calming and Lord yeah. knows it might have been right, right? Right, right but I watched Susie struggle and fight oh. and my instinct was she is not going for that yeah and I just was like nope no swaddling for this kid neither of my kids ever got swaddled Isn't that so but you know what yeah. good for you for listening to yourself right I mean, yeah. that's what we have to do as parents. Yeah. Some kids don't like to be swaddled and some kids only like to be swaddled. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like, there's a continuum as in everything, as in all of life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But good for you for listening to yourself and not trying to like force your kid when it felt wrong. Yeah. Right? And good for my mother for not being so deeply invested right. in doing <laughs> things her way yeah, absolutely. that she couldn't tolerate my having my own voice as a mother. Absolutely. So important. hint, hint to you grandmothers out there who are yes. going to uh, mm-hmm. be supporting your children yes. when they have them. Is That's a good, right? very yeah. good point. I it's, actually have part of that in my class. We talk a little bit about kind of like, you know, how to, how to balance like, you know, giving people respect and saying like, thank you for your help. And also like, this is my baby and this is a choice that I'm going to make for my yeah. kid. It's hard. It can be really hard, you know? Um, but so important. And you're right. Good for your mom for being able to be like, cool. Don't want to swaddle. We'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, great. So anyways, I started, that's why I started the preparing for postpartum class because I thought it was really important. And I also, I remember talking to 
a patient one time and I was asking her, I was like, what do you think? Like, you know, was the hardest part of your postpartum time. Right. And I thought she was going to be like my stage or something. I don't know, like something, whatever. (laughs) She's like, yeah. She was like, you know, the most, like the hardest and kind of most um, shocking part was the peri bottle. And I was like, really? So the peri bottle, right. For people that are pregnant or don't know, peri bottle is just a little bottle that you wash your vulva with Mm -hmm. afterwards when you have stitches because you're not using toilet paper. Um, you don't want to rub exact that area. Exactly. You don't want to so rub rinse it. it. So you rinse it with water. Um, but for this woman, she felt like, you know, she wasn't prepared that that was something that she was going to have to do. And she felt, she said that she felt like insulted that like a nurse was standing there watching her wash her bottom with this oh. water. And then she felt really dirty and all these things. Right. And because she had never even heard of it, she like kept questioning if this was like even a thing that people did or was this just some weird, yeah. you know, Yeah. she never had experience. It was with myster- it. mysterious. It was mysterious. Yeah. And then on top of mysterious, you're, you have no sleep and you your life has just been blown up and you're in pain. Right. So like it's mysterious and you're questioning if this is even something you have to do, but then you don't even have the capacity to really think about it, you know? Yeah. So anyways, her telling me that was like, okay, there needs to be a class where like, I pull out all the gear of like everything that you need for postpartum, like hemorrhoid cream and tux pads and, you know, the little ice diaper that you yeah. have to wear and the hospital panties that are like big and stretchy and great. You know, I pull all that stuff out and I'm like, this is what you are going to have to use. And like, this is why. And I think knowing why sometimes can just be so helpful. And if you've seen it before, you're like, oh, cool. Got it. I'm going to be wearing these really stretchy pants. Yeah. You know? No. Why bother bringing my thong underwear to the hospital? Oh, my God. I had a woman one time bring her pre-pregnancy jeans. Jeans. I'm like, listen, we're going to have a talk. Let's sit down. Yeah. Don't be bringing your pre-pregnancy jeans to the hospital. No. That's not happening for you for a little while. Yeah. You know? You'll just humiliate yourself. Yeah. Well, it's and also there's just, no need. There's no need. And it's also unrealistic expectations of what it's going to be. Like, your uterus is actually around, like, five-ish months pregnant, you know, when you're at the 24-hour mark. Yeah. That's that's up to your belly button. Yeah. But that's actually a big uterus, right? right. Yeah. Plus, you have all of the excess skin and you know, fat and everything else that's kind of collected over pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Blood not, volume. Blood it's volume. It's not gone yet. Yeah, it's yeah. doubled in pregnancy. Yeah. So there's a lot. Plus, you might have a lot of third spacing from maybe you got an IV in labor, mm-hmm. you know, and just the normal third spacing that happens postpartum. So, yeah, the point is you're not fitting into your thong and your postpartum genes right after you give Nor that. will you want to try. Right. right. Don't torture yourself. <laughs> I show people tux pads and I tell them how, like, a lot of people don't know that you don't just wipe it, right? You actually tuck it in and leave yeah. the pad next to your hemorrhoid. Yeah. And women are always like, what? And I'm like, did anyone wear a thong? Yes, we get used to it. And what would you rather have? A big, swollen, itchy hemorrhoid or maybe like a little thing? Relief. Yeah, yeah. a relief. So anyways, it's those little things that I talk about that I think is invaluable and so important mm-hmm. in terms of preparing, right? Especially since so many people have never seen a woman. Well, and and getting to see the actual stuff. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to talk about these things. It's right. another thing to actually hold yes. some of it in your hands. I pass it around. Everyone holds it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's brilliant. True. Yeah. And I it's important, it. right? Mm-hmm. And you should see some of the faces, like the sits bath one. What? Oh gosh. What was, I have a couple of, of things in there, you know, that represent different things. I'm trying to think of like, anyway, some of the, ant- I have people guess what they're for. Yeah. It's just a game that we play, <laughs> but some of the dads come up with like the best things ever where I'm just like oh that's what you think that's for okay cool guess what not for that um anyway so I I started the that the postpartum prep class really for that just to help women to prepare for it um and then in that class I also do a newborn care which like I said I do it from the perspective of like what's going to make your life easier like even really simple things like get the zipper pajamas not the button ones I mean it seems really simple Baby Gap has all those crazy weird buttons, like definitely not created by a mom, right? So it's like maybe get one or two cute outfits you can take a picture in. And after that, like go with like whatever, zipper, anything easy, Yeah, you know, your kid doesn't know and they're probably going to spit up on it, yeah. right? Oh, they so, will. Yeah. Yeah, they will, right? Yeah. Not and wrong. poop on And it. poop. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, the very, I'll tell you a really quick thing when, uh, right after I had my old, my oldest, 
my husband's a fire when he brought his whole crew over to the house. Just like they just stopped by, right? And I had my baby, and I went nobody out. prepared him. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, thank you for stopping by. So I threw on some quick blush or whatever, yeah. and I I come outside and I've got my baby, and I'm like, does anyone want to hold her? And everyone kind of was like, no, it's okay. And I'm like, oh, they're maybe being polite because like whatever, you know, they don't yeah. want to get her dirty. So I was like, okay, and I go back inside and I realized that she had pooped and I hadn't realized, and she had yellow like that breast milk yellow yellow all up her back and all over like the front of my shirt <laughs> and I was like lovely yeah that's why no one wanted to yeah <laughs> you're, you're good yeah they're like no thank you ma'am you, you go ahead and hold on to that baby I was like oh god but that's being a, right that's mm-hmm. postpartum mm-hmm. it's all unexpected yeah um anyways <laughs> So, yeah, so in the newborn part, I do it from that perspective yeah. of, like, you know, how can you make your, your life easier? Um, and then I do an infant CPR part, which is taught by Chris from In-Home CPR. Mm-hmm. He's a wonderful instructor, and I think he also keeps it, like, really good information, but not super scary. Right. Does that make not sense? Not overwhelming. Not overwhelming. Yeah. And he does he does a really good piece on, like, calling 911, like, things that I had never thought of. For example always writing your address down and putting it on the refrigerator. So if anyone's watching your kid, because sometimes people don't know the address, especially when they're panicking. I'd never thought of something like little simple tips like that. So anyways, I think he's amazing and great. Um, So he does an hour of kind of infant CPR first aid. Um, And then I do another section on like relationships, like (laughs) what's going to happen afterwards. Yeah. Um, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I have everyone write like, I give them all thank you cards and then I have them at two weeks postpartum when they're like in it, write a thank you card to their partners. So each partner does. Sweet. And the, really the idea is like, you know, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in like, I've changed nine diapers and you've changed three, like, you know, but actually like, but you know what? Thank you so much for bringing me the energy bar when I was feeding. That meant a lot. And like, you know, thank you so much for letting me sleep in and like taking the baby in the other room for a second, you know, little things like that. Well, and so often I think, um, partners in whatever they're doing don't have or know to create the moment to actually express those things. They Mm -hmm. may be feeling them deeply and broadly. I was, um, mom was sleeping dad was holding the baby Mm. this was two days ago and he's just beside himself just so thrilled Mm. with Mm. everything and you know things are difficult at times he acknowledges that but he just started talking to me about you know his wife Mm. and you know all the things about you know, what got them to have this baby. And Mm. then he just started weeping and saying, I'm so grateful, you know, and, and how often do partners actually, they may be feeling it, but to actually express it out loud to anybody, let alone their partner, you know, is, is a pretty huge and beautiful thing. It's beautiful. And to have to externalize it to not just be holding it close to have your partner hear yes. those things i mean a woman who's been through nine months of pregnancy yeah. managed to get through birth yes um and now is having to heal and recover which is not a cakewalk no uh-uh. um to hear that their partner is grateful to them for doing oh. like, walking that journey yes. and bringing this child into their lives is huge. It's huge. You know, I agree. Um, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So it um, is important to be yeah. thankful, right? And yeah. to hear, you're right, to hear that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, well, and I often hear mom saying thank you for every glass of water that somebody brings them. Yeah. But nobody says thank you to her for having right. the baby. <laughs> By the thinking. way, thank you for, yeah, no, it's yeah, true, right? having this incredible yeah. being and like keeping it alive, Yeah, which is right. like kind of a yes. big task. Right? Yes, breastfeeding yeah. is also not a cakewalk, no. so that you're doing this thing 12 times a day, you know, yeah. for the first two weeks when it's not easy and, you know, and then are willing to continue yeah. once it right. starts to right. finally <laughs> seem doable. You're like, oh, wait, um, you keep doing this? Is yeah. something you need every day? That's yeah. A- Okay. Got it. Got it. So yeah, to have that, um, it's important. It's huge. It's huge. I agree. And I think on the flip side, so important to thank 
the woman, but also so important to thank the partner because that can also happen, Mm -hmm. you know, is that the partner feels like, God, you know, like I am doing things and the mom's feeling like, you're not doing anything. I'm doing everything. You know, that happens, that dynamic happens and then resentment. Yeah. starts to sink in. So I think the more you can take a step back to just say such simple things, thank you. Mm-hmm. Like, just thank you. It doesn't need to be like some huge thing, but like, even if it's small, yes. like, thank you so much for closing that window. Cause I couldn't get up. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You know, it's, I am grateful. Yeah. And Thanks. that just fosters a, such a nicer environment. Like we're in this as a team, yeah. right? This isn't like, you're just helping me do this thing for this baby. No, it's like we're a team and we're working together. And like, yeah. thank you for your part and thank you for my part. Yeah. You know, I mean, our kids all play soccer these days. If they were, instead of high fiving each other, if they were like, you didn't do that right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that team wouldn't be a team for Absolutely. very long. No. Yeah. Right. You got to be thankful. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, My daughter's sitting right here. She's shaking yeah. her head. <laughs> she yeah. plays soccer. An assist is just as important, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. For That's sure. The goal. Can't get it can't get it into the goal without kicking it down the field together, right? <laughs> right? No, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it is it's super important. So anyways, those are the things that I'm doing for the postpartum mm-hmm. uh, like preparing time. Mm-hmm. I could go on and on and on. Yeah. It's like a six hour class, so it's like <laughs> I do a lot. Um but then the other part that I'm starting in January that I'm actually like really, really excited about is I'm starting a speaker series of moms or dads, any, Mm -hmm. any parent Mm -hmm. uh, coming and teaching classes about something they're an expert in. So I have three moms already that are signed up and I have a couple more moms kind of in the wings getting ready to, to sign up. And the idea is I'm to have a class that you can bring your child to, but the topic is something that you care about and you want to learn about. Right. So I'll have toys there. Your kid can play with the toys, especially when they're babies. It's a lot easier to put them in the ergo. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, But then you get to learn something because I found that staying at home, I was like, all right, cool. I need to get out and like, you know, talk to adults. Maybe I'll sign up for like a baby, like mommy and me class or something Mm -hmm. like that, Mm -hmm. which by the way, with twins, everything's (laughs) one-on-one. So it's really hard to find a class. Thank you, Park and Rec for, um, not having so many restrictions, but yes. you go to these classes and I started looking around. Right. And what I found was moms would, you know, kind of try, you know, be talking to each other a little bit, but we'd be like trying to sing these songs and trying to do the activities. And half the time, like my babies did not care. They didn't care about these songs. They, they weren't, they didn't feel, it enga- didn't feel engaging. And I was like losing my mind because it's like, I already know EIL. I know the words. Like I've got that down. I know what a chicken (laughs) says. I know what a cow says. Like those (laughs) things I know and I have learned. Um, But what I would like to learn about is like, I don't know, like what's going on in this world right now? Or like, what's the deal with like having sex after a baby? Like that's the Mm -hmm. one thing, one of my topics I have. Or like, you know, how could I you know, foster my identity or like a sewing class. Anyways, mm-hmm. but there's nothing you can take your kid to. Right. Right. Because it's true. It, there's nothing. Yeah. And I started looking around. My husband's like, you should take some classes. I'm like, great idea. Oh, I don't have childcare for like yeah. half the classes. Yeah. I'm going to do that. And, and appropriate childcare for a breastfeeding mom is not childcare that where they have to drop their babies yes. off and leave. Yes. Exactly. I mean, it might be if they're at the stage where they would like to pump and leave their children, which is perfectly acceptable. Right. If they can find that, you know, it's absolutely. Well, I think also too, then comes that like, you know, when you're breastfeeding, right. And you're pumping, then you have to basically kind of weigh things out. Like what's my most important hour that I want to take for myself. Do I want to do it to yoga? Do I want to do it to this class? Do I want to do it for a walk, sleep? Yeah. Like what, what hour am I going to take for myself? Like, how am I going to use that? Right. Right? Because that's what you got with your pumped milk. Right. It's not like an endless supply of time that you have. Um, so you, exactly. That's exactly right. That's exactly why I wanted to have something where you could bring your child with you. Yeah. Right. And, um, still be able to learn things that are interesting. So right now I'm at the stage of kind of in January, we'll start our first classes, which I'm really excited about. Um, and now I just want to get more teachers. I want to get more parents that are interested. And the other thing is, you know, postpartum, you could have a baby, but you still have like interests or like really cool. You're an expert at really cool things. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear from people, anyone out there listening mm-hmm. that's an expert in something that wants to teach a class and like bring your baby. That's yeah. fine. You can breastfeed and teach. It doesn't have to be about parenting. No, not yeah. about parenting. Yeah. Like a couple of the classes that I have are about parenting, but 
really my ultimate goal is to have it be not about parenting because we have expand the brain. Yeah. We have other identities, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's like, we should be by the whole, the whole start of mom mental really was to help parents foster other identities, Mm -hmm. not just mom or dad. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like we are also people, you know, I mean, during all my years of parenting and grandparenting, I'm also somebody who's very interested in sustainability issues and yeah. ecology and how do you live in a city and try to do things in a environmentally sensitive way. Yes, and, yes. You know, that's a huge topic huge. and it's parents huge. kind of are doing uh, their parenting choices by default because they don't understand the choices. Yeah. I mean, not that it has to be about parenting, but you know, there's five choices in diapering. Absolutely. It's so much. Right? It's so much. And yeah. some of them on the scale of sustainability and pollution causing are hideous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's going to yeah. be a lot of diapers in the yes. landfill. So yes. something as simple as that, which kind of overlaps, right? There's parenting choices, but then there's the larger issue of your kids are going to grow up yeah. in, in this, this world, world. in this environment that... Yes you know, you're currently responsible for. But then it's like also too, you know, exactly what you're saying is right in the sense that like parents also sometimes don't have the capacity or like the brain space at this moment Mm -hmm. to make that decision. I mean, can you imagine postpartum trying to figure out which of these five diapers? Like, no, I'm just going to grab whatever's closest. Yeah. Whoever, whatever someone brings me from the store, like that's what I'm going to use. Yeah. Right. Right. And you know, even when you're pregnant, sometimes you can just feel like a lot, you know, to make these decisions. So you're right. Having some classes. If you want to teach a class on sure. sustainability, <laughs> contact me and I would love to have you teach a class. Yeah. But it's true. Even like a one hour class where it's like, oh, somebody already did the research. Somebody already thought about it. Now I can learn about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it's so important. Mm-hmm. It's so important. So that's what I'm doing. I'm really excited about it. I think it. it's brilliant. Thanks. I'm really, yeah. yeah, I'm really happy. Now, Serena, you, well, before we started recording, you mentioned, and I'm a little sad that we don't have Susan here with us. Oh, yeah, Maybe I can yeah. get her to come on the podcast as well. But do you mind um, saying a few words about the initiative that you and Susan are ta- yeah. undertaking? Yeah. So um, Homeless Prenatal, which I was talking about yeah. earlier, uh, is a wonderful program and a lot of their clients are monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, they do offer a no cost doula program there. So like a volunteer doula program there. So Fantastic. women will come and volunteer to be birth doulas. And also um, they don't have a fully fleshed out postpartum doula program yet, mm-hmm. but they do do a lot of home visiting the caseworkers do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but they would like to have a more kind of uh, regimented, mm-hmm. I guess, um, volunteer postpartum doula program as well. Um, But what they were finding is that a lot of the women that were coming to volunteer as doulas were not in the same demographic as the women that they were serving. Right. Which, you know, is, is neither is, you know, it has its, its, you know, consequences here and there. But one of the biggest ones is language, right? So if you're going to be a doula client for somebody, but you don't speak their language, that makes it very challenging to support that person. So both culturally and also linguistically, right? Mm -hmm. So Ali Quentos, who is also a doula, I don't know if you know her. I totally know yeah. her. She teaches birthing from within yes, classes. Yes, she's amazing. She's right? wonderful. Yes, you should interview her. Yeah, she's, yes, great. she's um, And she's also an show. owner of Community Well, which is right. a fantastic or And actually, that's the place where I teach my classes, yeah. is at Community Well. Um, so Ali Quentos, and um, she teamed up with some people from Homeless Prenatal, and they started to create this idea of having a volunteer doula program for monolingual Spanish speakers in order to serve their clients that are monolingual Spanish speakers. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's so genius. And then, um, part of it was being able to use former clients of HPP as doulas. But the thing where they were kind of getting a little bit slowed down was how to train women in a cost effective way and in their language, because actually out there in the Bay area, there's nothing, there's no Spanish language, doula training, like complete Spanish language doula trainings and doula trainings are very costly. Yeah. They make us a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have to be able to kind of read and write well in that language, right? Because yeah. there's a certain amount of writing that goes along with getting certified as a doula and all those things. So they came up with the idea and then I kind of jumped on board, um, 
a few months ago of, of creating a volunteer doula program in Spanish and creating a training for women in Spanish um, to be able to do doula work. So the idea is that once women get trained, they'll be able to volunteer for homeless people. And there's other organizations too that are interested in kind of teaming up. Mm-hmm. Um, but also they'll be able to be doulas on their own. And maybe that could be a source of income. Right. For women, yeah. which is so amazing, right? Yeah. Um, as postpartum doulas, because a lot of them will have their own kids being former clients, mm-hmm. um, or birth doula work. And, you know, having women be able to form teams and meet people in these trainings mm-hmm. and form teams and say, like, hey, you know what? We've all got kids. I can take Fridays and Thursdays, whatever. You take Wednesdays and Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. We'll be like a three person doula team. And make it work for birth doula. So that's our ultimate goal. So our trainings are actually coming up really soon. And Susan Arthur also has been working with us. So um, our little team has been me and then Susan Arthur and then Ali Quintos and then Emmeline from Homeless Prenatal. Nice. Um, yeah, it's been great. It's a great team. Um, and the doula trainings are coming up in March. We start our first ones. And the most amazing and wonderful thing is that we've created a bunch of different modules, you know, of things that you need to learn as a doula. Mm-hmm. And people from San Francisco are volunteering to teach those classes. So we have someone from Infant Parent Program, um, San Francisco General. She's coming and teaching things about perinatal loss and mm-hmm. um, trauma. And then, you know, we have somebody else coming teaching about resources in the community. So it's really exciting. That's so it's very fantastic. Exciting. And it's all at Community Well which is an amazing um, community center who's now and a good and a good area of town for great area to trying to do this. Yeah. It's in the Excelsior. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Like it's Mm -hmm. so perfect. Um, but really I have to give the credit for the idea to Ali Quentos, um, mm-hmm. cause she really, I think was the brainchild yeah. of all of this. Yeah. Um, I've just been kind of helping wherever mm-hmm. I can, but <laughs> it's a really, it's a really cool thing and they do accept donations. So if you're interested in Great. donating to that, yes. um, contact the community well, well done. um, cause that's where we're going to hold all of those. Hear that mm-hmm. listeners. Actually there's a program you can give to. Yes. There's a program you can give to and actually. The way we got the initial funding to even start um, just for supplies, like we just need, you know, like paper and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff, um, came from doula clients of Ali and Shannon, who, yeah. you know, Shannon. Yeah, of um, course. They, She's my neighbor. Is she? Yeah. She's so great. I love She's her. so great. Um, but it came from their doula clients. Mm-hmm. We're donating like 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever they could you know, yeah. donate. Mm-hmm. And they were able to raise tons of money to even start this initiative pretty amazing like it's yeah. very grassroots and really cool they've yeah. done pretty amazing work fantastic um, yeah so happy to hear about all these wonderful things that yeah. are going on and then emily erickson sorry i have to mm-hmm. say her of from homeless prenatal she's also the person that's like running everything from the homeless prenatal side of it i don't want to leave her out of course so yeah awful. no that's but brilliant she's also been amazing yeah so glad to hear boy you're you're a busy mom. I know. I know. <laughs> but you know, though. I think I I just you know, on a more philosophical note, tell me what you think. Like I think there's something so um generative <laughs> about being a mother in the first year to three mm-hmm. years. There's something that just spurs you. Mm-hmm. Um not only is just motherhood so rich a subject perennially, Mm -hmm, right? Everyone mm -hmm, who goes mm -hmm. through it is kind of recreating it for the first time Mm -hmm, uh, in their own lives. But also um, I think something you touched on earlier, which is just there's a crisis of, of um, identity and I and I say that in a in a positive sense, like uh, the opportunity of identity, right? Absolutely. You're whatever you thought you were mm-hmm. prior to being pregnant, prior to having a new human in your family, and and addressing all of the social, emotional, spiritual, and physical demands of that. Mm-hmm. Even though it's for most of us, on the one hand fairly exhausting right, right, right. at the same time it's also the thing that says makes you say in that crisis yeah. of identity well then who am i yeah what yeah. am i what do i do yeah. how do i think about the world it's all shifting yeah. 
absolutely beneath you in a sense. And so that opportunity to, to rethink your entire self yeah. is so rich. I agree. It totally can be agree. terrifying, but it can also just be like, okay, well, since I'm a new person, what new person am I? Yeah, absolutely. You know? I totally agree. Yeah. I think, you know, as a midwife, right, of course, I talk to women all the time about yeah. this, right, postpartum, whatever, yeah. um, birth, and I've had women come to my office and say, like, I think I have postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And once I start talking to them, I realize, so I've coined a new term, which I call postpartum growing pains. Mm -hmm. And that's actually more accurate into what it is. It's exactly what you're saying. Like, you're growing into a new person. There is no way to go back. And I think that sometimes I hear a lot of terminology of, like, bounce back or, like, get back. Ugh. Like yeah. you we talk can, a lot about that on our yeah. program. Yeah. But it's like, look, yeah. you not just physically, right? Yeah. But like as a person, a human being, your identity, you cannot go backwards. And like, I don't want to be 12 again. No. Right? No. And I can't actually. Right. right? Yeah. So <laughs> like we can only move forward in our life. And so you're right. It is a huge shift in your identity and a huge kind of change in every part of you. So I think the idea of trying to go back and recapture old identities is what gets people feeling down and what's so difficult. Not only that, but if you're like, well, I just, I was this person who I really was familiar with and really liked prior to this baby. And that's, that bottom has dropped out, but now the prescribed Right. Role, roles and activities don't appeal to me. Right. I don't want to be the mom who um, does things a certain way. Mm-hmm. And yet I don't yet know of another way to do this. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, if you're balancing, like I'm not who I was and now there's this prescription for who I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be whether it's stated out loud by anyone or you just have imagined it, right? But it doesn't work for you. Then there's this huge well of mystery that's kind of intimidating, let's face it. And that, of course, can be depressing, right? It's like, whoa, scary. I'm not diving into that. I'm not diving into that (laughs) pool or or I don't, I'm afraid to dive in. Totally. I'm finding myself falling into it. And that doesn't feel safe. And so, yeah, I think the anxiety of being a new mother is makes perfect sense. Totally. So to be able to reach out into the world for a little bit more resource, yes. you know, those little, those little safety lines, you know, of friendship and communication with other moms totally. and, and, um, you know, hopefully people who aren't going to tell you this is how you should do no it. No way. Well, there or is no you're way. broken if you feel oh, blue no. every day. You're not broken. Mm-hmm. You're shifting. shifting. You're you're in a process totally. that requires resource. Absolutely. Um, and respectful. You're growing. Yeah, and yeah. you're growing alongside your child. Yeah, and you're gaining also, an ounce a day. <laughs> you're also keeping another human being alive, yes, right? So this yeah. is huge identity shift. Yeah, you're changing in every part of your life, yeah. and then you also are responsible for someone, which is actually a huge thing. I remember postpartum, I was sitting with my twins, and they were breastfeeding. And I used to do tandem breastfeed them, like football style, yeah. right? <laughs> so I was holding them both football style, and then I was looking at my um, my little one sitting at my feet, who was like five. And all of a sudden I like burst into tears and my aunt was sitting there. She's like, whoa, like what's going on? I'm like, there's so many eyeballs looking at me. <laughs> like, it's just Six, so many eyeballs. Eight. <laughs> you know? And I think that's part of it, right? Is that yeah. you have this huge identity, but like people are also watching this yeah. crazy change, which is not the way it is when you're a teenager, right? Not everybody's like picking apart. But when you become a parent, all of a sudden everyone has an opinion about, right, everything you're doing. So there's also that, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm super scared to dive into this. How? What kind of mom am I going to be? What kind of dad am I going to be? What kind of partner or whatever? But then everyone also is picking apart and watching it. Well, not only that, there, there's this implication that you can somehow know those things. Yeah. You cannot. No. I have a 40-year-old. I could not <laughs> project at all into that. I mean, I certainly had my hippie earth mother, uh, you know, image 
yeah, my, yeah. My, my idea of how I could be a good mom. And believe me, I spent decades of recrimination right. on myself <laughs> for not having met that mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. But I also had a life alongside my children mm-hmm. and also separate from yeah. my children. Yes. And the two didn't always mesh the way if I look back and in fantasy eye, right. eyeglasses, you know, would have liked everything to mesh and yeah. fit together. And, um, and here they are, yeah. they've made it to adulthood. Yeah. They're having full rich lives. They're having struggles yeah. just like you and I like have human had, beings, like human yeah. beings <laughs> do. And um, I'm not always the best person to support them in those struggles either. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, you're a just because your mom doesn't mean you have a magic wand for everything. Exactly, and I think that's the thing that hits you like a ton of bricks, right? When you become a mom, is that you all of a sudden realize, oh shoot, I thought that once I became a mom, I would like be this other person, right? I'd be like this mom, and like yeah. I'd bake cookies <laughs> or whatever your image was, right? Yeah. Like I only use organic products ever, right? Whatever your thing, right, yeah. is, um, and then you realize like, oh shoot, I'm. St- I'm still actually the same person I was before. I just have added this yeah. new thing on. Yes. Right. A I still huge scoop. Yeah. The same things stuff. that used to like make me insane before mm-hmm. my same triggers, those same things still set me off. Mm-hmm. Right. There's not some magic reset button happens yeah. when you give birth, you know? So yeah, you're right. It's like, of course we all look back and be like, I wish I'd done things different or this different, or I wish I could mm-hmm. do that. But like looking backwards is so counterproductive. Right. We just do whatever we can do yeah. in that moment, yeah. right? And I think that giving ourselves permission to foster other parts of our identities, we don't just have to be the stellar parent because yeah. guess what? You're never going to be the perfect parent. Even if you're like a parent that like bakes cookie, I don't know why I'm having a cookie party, so I'm thinking yeah. about cookies, <laughs> but you know, whatever, your kid might not like cookies, right? right? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like your style of parenting might not work for your kid but it doesn't mean you can't like cookies exactly right i mean that's the thing like it's okay you can be a human being like just be a human being it's okay yeah you know yeah hey fellow parents can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood you know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world but let's be real some things are better kept in the family and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memory secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the family album map. The family album map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the app store today, search family album, one word, download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. And I think in some ways that's the best way to model um, acceptance. Yes. And lo- I mean, it, if it's a core value of yours that your child experience acceptance and love and support will give yourself some absolutely because if they 100%. see you being able to feel resourced by reaching out or reaching in yes and taking that time and feeding yourself while you're feeding them yes, yes. you know just the simple basic human needs yes. for starts yeah um that's a deep abiding lesson for a child absolutely yeah. absolutely and like How cool is it that you could teach them something that you've learned that's interesting from like reading a book or listening to a podcast or (laughs) taking a class, whatever, then like a nursery rhyme that like is making you insane and they can see it in your eyes and like (laughs) you don't care about it, right? Why not? Why not like read a cool book while you're breastfeeding and read it out loud to your kids so they hear your voice, they get the language stuff, but then you're feeding yourself because you're going to be a happier person and so is your kid. Yeah. Because they can tell kids know, kids know when you're like you know, doing all this stuff and stressing yourself out and doing all the stuff for them. They're like, thanks mom. But like, you don't seem like a ha- like you're so grumpy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get all for you. 
too. But it's yeah. like, no, do something for yourself, Mom. It's going to make me feel better. Yeah. I think I really believe and, that. And do it, do it with full, embrace it fully. I mean, so often, and I speak from experience. We'll take that time to say, oh, I really need to do this thing for myself. But then we don't give it to ourselves fully. Mm. We berate ourselves the whole time yes. that we're not doing that other thing that yes. would be good for someone else. Yes, that's you so know? true. That's such yeah. a good, you're so right. Yeah, That's so just, true. Just dive deep into it and let yourself have it um, fully. Uh, because we that's what we want for others. Yes. You know? Absolutely. So. Do do you know Amelia Crest? She's someone you should probably no. look up. You basically all could look her up. Um, mm-hmm. She's uh, this hilarious, um, she does like therapy and she works with a lot of postpartum moms, but she made these amazing cards, which I can show you mm-hmm. later on. But one of them says, hold yourself like you hold them. Yeah. You know, and the idea just being exactly what you said, right, yeah. is like, you know, invest fully in yourself in the same way that you invest in your kids, yeah. right? You want the best for them, but you, why don't you want the best for yourself? Right. Right. Well, I mean, I think that we grow up with a really am, ambiguous message. If we grow up in households where the message is, I'm sacrificing for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I can't have anything nice because of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who wants yeah. to grow up like that? Uh, Ooh, that's terrible. That's it's no hard. Fun, no. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. no fun. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Take care of yourself and then everyone else will be happier, yeah. including your partner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and there's where coming back around, um, if you can take a wonderful class about preparing to be postpartum and learn some basic tips for how to nourish yourself yes. during this period of major, wonderful Upheaval, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> wonderful upheaval. Yeah, you know, then that um, you know, do yourself that favor. Absolutely. Well, that's why yeah. that's why I teach those classes is yeah. because you should you have to prepare for it. Yeah. There is some prep that goes along, you know. And if you've never seen what somebody postpartum, you better learn like what's going on there, yeah. so that you and also too, people think things aren't normal. Like ninety percent of the things that people would come and tell me, like, oh God, this happened or that happened. Like, guess what? That's normal. And they're like, it is. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah if normal. only they'd know. If right? only they'd know. And then, they, and then what happens is that you feel depressed or you feel sad or you feel like, God, I don't feel like breastfeeding again. I just, I just breastfed you. Again. Right. And then, so you'd have, like, you guys have talked for too long. No, no, no. We'll just keep going. But you know what I mean? So you've layered. So it's like you've had this, all these emotions and then you layer guilt on top of it, which yeah. is so unnecessary. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't help anybody involved. It doesn't help yeah. anybody. So it's like, even just knowing that like what you're feeling is normal helps to be like, okay, like I'm not an insane person or I'm not like a, a, a not a good mom, right. Or not a good dad or partner. Yeah. Um, I'm normal. Yeah. That's actually yeah. really cool to know. Like yeah. other people felt this way too. Yes. Like, okay, cool. Like I can just feel it and not have to layer this whole other heap of like, guilt and questioning and mystery, you know? Yes. And so much of our anxiety comes from that. Yeah. Right. That powerful combination of, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. I, therefore I must not be doing it right. right, Which could be patently untrue. You could be doing brilliantly, but because nobody told you it was okay to do it that way. Now you're feeling scared that you're doing it wrong and guilty right you didn't know ahead of time right right (laughs) well I think also too a lot of parents who are having those feelings like oh god I feel like I'm not doing well they're actually like the best parents right because they're so thoughtful in their parenting yeah do you know what I mean yeah I tell them they care about yeah Yeah. I had one woman one time a long time ago to labor and delivery class that we talked about like what are our fears and she was like my biggest fear is I won't be a good mom and I'm like, let me let you know. I don't know you, but yeah. Yeah. just by asking that question and having that fear, you're going to be fantastic. Yeah. Like you've already thought you're, you're invested. thoughtful. You're invested. <laughs> you're thinking about it. That's great. Yeah. And guess what? You're going to be a great mom. You're going to yeah. be great. So let that piece go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And reach out for support. And reach out. Reach yeah. out for support. It's so important. Like, and talk to other moms in a free and open way. Yeah. Right? Yes. Like, the other day I talked to this mom. I randomly met her. You can tell probably I'm like a talker, right? So <laughs> I met this woman. She had a baby. And we started talking. She's like, oh, yeah, things are going great, 
right? But I kind of see in her eyes like she wasn't. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, well, good for you because, like, I had a hard time postpartum. Like, it was rough. And right when I said it, she was like, yes, I did it. And I did it and all these things. And I was like, listen, moms, like, don't fake the funk. Don't fake it. Don't go and feel like you got to be like, everything is so great. And she's a miracle. Yes, he's a miracle. I get it. That's fine. But, like, you don't have to feel this, like, bliss. I think there's this thing where people feel like they have to say, like, oh, well, at least you and your baby are healthy. And it's like, well, yes, of course. That goes without saying. But I also feel like crap. Like, I, I'm not feeling good. You there's know? a beautiful um, a little illustration, kind of a cartoon illustration. I hate to call it that because we always think of the funnies, right? Right, right, right. And it's um, it's a mom with a little baby in her arms, and then a, a person who a, sort of looks to be possibly male mm. and could possibly be that person's partner. And they're asking this mom, you know, uh, do you need anything? Mm. Right. Mm. And the answer, the the verbal answer is, no, I'm fine. And then you see this cascade of a list of right. I could use a bath. I could, I'm hungry all the time. I'm, you know, like yes. all the things that postpartum mothers, and I'll use a strong word, suffer yeah. with right? Yeah. Because nobody knows to just do the thing, yeah. right? Somewhere in that list, there's one thing that you could do for her, yes. even if it's just put food on a plate and put it near her. Yes. Um, hold the baby while she takes a shower. Yeah. Um, or, diaper the baby while she takes a pee, you know. Or sim- listen while she has a cry. Yes. And not have to say, well, at least... Blah, blah, blah. Right. No, I want to have a cry. Yeah. I want to talk about it. Yeah. Right? That kind of thing starts early. It starts in the hospital when the nurse says, you know, gee, you know, uh, mom's saying, gosh, I, I'm having pain and breastfeeding is difficult and I had surgery and, you know, the whole list of disappointments sure. and or pain that she's experiencing now. And the answer to that is... At least you have a healthy baby. Oh, God, it's the worst. It just shuts it down right there. It's like done. Okay, you have no space here. I have nothing for you. Yeah. I can't give you one simple thing. When the answer might have been, I'm sorry that you're having such a difficult Mm -hmm. time. I'm going to bring you a snack or a warm blanket. A warm blanket. Something simple, anything would be better than. At least tough shit for you. Yeah. I mean, no, it's true. You know, You're yeah. right. It's true. Yeah, and it's it's not fair. No. Like, why can't I say how I feel, and why can't I feel that way? Yeah, right. You know, it's like, and I think it it's so silly that we have to feel like we have to say, "I love my baby, but." I love my baby so much, but yes, that goes without saying. We know, we know you love your baby. Like we all love yeah. our children. Like, you know, my heart is like so big and full because yeah. of my three girls. Like I'm, it brings so much joy to my life, but it also brings a lot of craziness. Like <laughs> I did not have this much gray hair. Okay. Like this is, this is a parenting thing that has happened through my life. Right. But you know, it's okay to say it. It's yeah. okay. It's okay to say it. And guess what? Totally normal. Totally well, yeah. normal to feel that way. I mean, I... I have two children. The first was born with a a flash of identity and deep love at first sight. Yeah. The second was born and I didn't have that same experience. And I thought something was deeply wrong with me. And over the course of the next days and weeks, what I realized was, no, I'm falling in love with him sort of, slowly Mm -hmm. and deeply it was just a different Different. style we have very different relationships my two children and and i and they have their own relationship which i barely understand i mean and it's brilliant yeah but the fact is that we don't you know every relationship is its unique thing absolutely and so to allow parents to understand like you know, every relationship is different. Totally. Every relationship er- arises differently. It's okay if you don't feel what you think you're supposed to feel. Totally. What do you actually feel? Let's yes. let's hear about that. It's okay yeah. to express what you're actually totally. feeling. And what a gift to give new parents. Because what if someone had come to you and said, 
hey, whatever you're feeling, it's cool. It would have taken off this whole layer of guilt and self, like, you know, recrimination, recrimination yes. and all yeah. that stuff, right? Yeah. It would have taken that piece off and you could have just fallen in love slow, yeah. right? But instead, all we add all this other stuff yeah. on. But if someone had just let you talk about it, yeah, you know, I mean, and you're right. It's, the baby's also different. Like, yes. that's also a real thing. I think people think like, oh, you know, I'm a parent, so all my kids, like, it'll be the same. No, like, each kid that I've had, like, when I, the minute I hold them, I'm like, oh, yeah. you're totally different. Yeah. Then I mean, you have sister. twins and you know that, yeah. right? Like, and they're, they're twins. Not- yeah. <laughs> that is exactly, that's like a real, like, nature versus nurture, right? That's like an actual experiment of nature versus nurture. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, they're opposite. One's a night person. One's a morning person. One was like amazing breastfeeder. The other one like could not figure not out so what a nipple much. was for. Yeah. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, it's just, and she, the one that was like a terrible breastfeeder, she's still a terrible eater. Like yeah. she just hates eating. So she's she just is. not into it. Mm-hmm. Whereas my other one, she'll eat anything. She doesn't care. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just so interesting. Yeah. And they're just people. And you're right. Newborn, I felt the same thing. Like, my first one, I, like, pulled her to my arms and was like, ah, you know, like a Lion King moment. But then, (laughs) like, my other two, I remember being like, what? Like, what? I'm not sure about You know? It was like, it took me a second. It was also two at the same time. So I was like, oh, wait, now I have to also, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, and for twin moms, I have a tip. Tandem breastfeed. Tandem breastfeed. I know it's really difficult, but if you don't tandem breastfeed, you spend your entire day breastfeeding. Yeah. Anyway, that's a tip for twin moms. Another twin mom told me that, and it was really hard in the beginning to like coordinate that and figure it out. Yeah. Especially when, like you say, you've got one who's willing to do it anytime you offer and one who's kind of like, I don't know about this. Yeah. And like couldn't open her mouth. I mean, it was so hard. But what I, what I did was I put the one on that was really good breastfeeder. So my letdown would happen. So milk would start coming out of the other breast. Mm -hmm. Then I would put the other one on. And then while this one was on, like really latched on well, then I could kind of mess with the other one. I don't know. To me, tandem breastfeeding was like the only way to go for twin moms, just because otherwise you're just breastfeeding all the time. And, and you just speaking from the doula perspective, Moms need help finding their way with twins yeah. in a special way. I mean, you know, I've worked with, with the moms whose baby wasn't going to eat. You know, one yeah. of them was just a chow hound and the other wasn't going to eat, was going to scream at that breast the whole time. Yes. And survival meant bottle feeding that kid. Yeah, You know, totally. it was just, I, I worked with a mom. She taught me the most about breastfeeding in <laughs> one big epiphany because she she had a three-year-old and mm. then twins, and one throughout the pregnancy had been larger, yeah. sturdier, and the other had been kind of Smaller. failing to thrive, sure. you know, and all of that. And she just knew about that little girl. She, you know, she put the one on the breast. That was fine. She knew the other was too small, not vigorous enough. She pumped. She bottle-fed that other baby. And then one day I saw her weeks and weeks later and uh because I got her through the first yeah, few yeah. weeks and then I saw her out and about and she goes oh I have a story for you she said you know I I didn't even offer the breast mm. to the smaller baby but then one day about six weeks mm. old she said I'm gonna give this a try yeah that baby latched on wow and she put away the pump and that was it so wow. she, I mean talk about instinct yeah Right? Yeah, like, absolutely. You just never know. It's true. You never uh, know. But that and mom like, did. <laughs> but the mom did. But then she also trusted her, right? She yeah. wasn't trying to force something that wasn't nope. happening. She it was, was like, like right, this cool. is going to happen or it won't. Yeah. And we'll know what to do next. Yeah. And so it was really lovely to just to hear that sort of anything goes. It's all experimental. Totally. It's okay to try things. Don't feel like a failure. You know, it's, totally. it's easily half baby and let's face it, it's more like 75% baby. Yeah. So just find out who that baby is and totally. try things. Try things, try different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so true yeah. for the, my littlest one, we had to syringe feed her mm-hmm. for the first like week. Yeah. Which was, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> right. Terrible. Right. But. And you had to keep her alive. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you but did. I guess you gotta say alive. Yeah. And she finally figured it out, you know, yeah. eventually, but. 
Yeah. Yeah. You just do what you can do, Mm -hmm. do what you can do and get extra help. I was so lucky that I had my mom, my aunt. I have my, um, all my cousins are teenagers. Nice. I know. They've yeah. gone away to college this year in September. Oops. I know. <laughs> Don't I Don't have any more babies. I know. I was like, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> I was, his, you know, crying. I'm like, I didn't think I'd miss you so much. Yeah. Um, but I guess they have their own identities that they have to do, you know, college, Gosh. whatever. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the point is I had so much support and Mm -hmm. I think that like I tell that to all of my patients and everybody that's about to have a baby, get your support when you're pregnant, right? Like if you need to hire a postpartum doula, like do that. If you need, if you want, if you have people coming like from out of town, maybe stagger it so you get longer time of help. Right. Yeah. Like maybe your parents can come first, then your partner's parents can come second, then your brother can come next and your sister can, you know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that you have a long time. Cause people always, I hear parents all the time. They're like, I just want to have like our little cocoon moment for the first couple of weeks. And I'm like, no dude, but no, you yeah. need hands. That's yeah. what need, you need. You need yeah. hands to help you. Yeah. And people that are useful, right. You know, you know, your aunt is crazy and she's just going to be like a burden. Don't, don't invite her over. That's fine. Yeah. We get that. But you know what I'm saying, plan for it. Have healthy boundaries. Know what you know about the capacities of your people. Support system, yeah. And and don't overstress yourself with management. Yes. You can't, you should not put yourself in a place to be managing other people if they either can hit the ground running or they can't. So be, don't be in denial about that. 100%. That's 100% right. Yeah. Yeah. Get people in there. That, who can know, actually just do, do it. something yeah. yeah, without having yeah. to like, yeah. and what is that? I mean, mostly that's cooking and cleaning. Yeah. Totally. You know, and, um, making sure you're well fed. Yeah. Um, and not talking to you when your baby's sleeping. Cause that's when you're <laughs> supposed to be sleeping. Yes, it's so true. Yeah. Or not so. asking you to do anything. Like yeah. after my first was born, um, we had a brunch like two days after she was born, which was crazy, but whatever we are crazy. <laughs> and I remember at one point someone was like, Serena, can you grab me? Blah, 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 whatever it was. And my best friend turned around and was like, excuse me, please do not ask her for anything. Yes. Okay. If anyone needs something, you're going to go ahead and get yourself. And yeah. we're all going to do the dishes before we leave. Yeah. But like that's, that's was, a friend. I know yes. she's my yeah. best friend. Yeah. Um, and she's like the godmother of my parents, but that is what you need. Postpartum, you need someone to be like, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead and not ask her for anything, you know, or the partner. Yeah. Like I also didn't want anyone asking my husband for anything because yeah. he was also exhausted too. Like, right. you know, and you need him the most. I did. Right? The yeah. baby needs him. Yeah. Not random people. Yeah. Right? No, it's true. That's the cocoon is the three of you being well cared for. Yes. Well cared for. Yeah. It's true. Get that. I mean, there's lots of cultures where 40 days you don't go out of the house. And people, when I tell people that when they're pregnant, they're like, that's so crazy. And I'll see them all afterwards and they'll be like, yeah, that would have been really nice. Just someone to like care for you for 40. And 40 days sounds so long, but like I did that with my first and it was beautiful. Yeah. Like beautiful. Yeah. You know, once you have an older kid, you can't do it as much. No. But still. But you're also just, maybe ever so slightly more prepared, sure. you know, to. Yeah. So I think exactly there are compensations to you to dealt with that, that identity well. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. You've already you made the there. choice the second time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I heard a comedian, any second children don't repeat this, but she was like, all you first kids, you guys were like created out of love and your parents wanted to create a family and all the second kids, yeah. you were a companion. <laughs> first one. And I and me being a first child, I'm like, well, yes. My brother was like, uh, no, no. He's like, yeah. when they made me, it was so perfect. They stopped. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess you could see it both ways. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Anyways, but yes, it's true. Get support postpartum and prepare, prepare, and then prepare for like logistical things afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like who's going to come and clean my house? Who's going to cook my food? Like who's going to walk my pet? Right. Like those are some things, right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, prepare. And then when you are postpartum, hold your, hold your boundaries, but accept help also. Like you might be not into your parent, you know, your partner's mom. Right. But like, if she can cook and clean, I don't know, maybe she can come in. There's a way to communicate with her about that. Exactly. That engenders a good time. 
Yeah. Yeah. And someone else was telling me one time, she was like, you know, I always tell people like, it's cool, like be friends with your mother-in-law because when your kid is sick and your daycare won't take your sick kid, your mother-in-law will. Yeah. And it's so true. Good strategy. And that's like, yeah. I called my mother-in-law, I'm like, hey, yeah. I was just yeah. thinking. How would you like to we hang out with a sick kid yeah. right now? <laughs> By the way, my kid's sick. Yeah. I'm yeah. dropping him off. Yeah. Um, but it's so true, right? Yeah. Like it's just, it's it's one of those. Well, not only that, I think on the other side of, of giving birth, you you do begin to have a kind of new appreciation for who these people are who raised oh, yeah. you and your partner. Now that when I say appreciation, I use it in the broadest sense totally. of the term, right? Like you still, you have a new light on what didn't work for you as a kid. Yeah. Totally. You also have a new light on, gee, it couldn't have been easy for these people every moment. Yeah to just make the right decision that would be perfect for me. Totally. Right. Yeah. There are other things involved. And so, yeah, I think, um, that doesn't mean everything is excused. No, 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 not at all. It means that you, you just understand it. You begin to have a perspective that mediates that adolescent, uh, uh, Right. Well, the idea, irritation. Well, just yeah. the idea, yeah. right? That society has that you were talking about earlier of you know parents have to be always self sacrificing, right? Like yeah. that's a thing that parents should be, right? Yeah. We think like that as teenagers or as adolescents, or whatever. But once you have your own kid, you realize like, oh, yeah, they were that's a person not a before. Yeah. Kid. yeah, yeah, exactly. They were a person before, and they're now just a person. So it's like, yeah, you're right. Not everything's forgiven, but there you do get a a different perspective, I guess. Yeah. Right. And it can go both ways. I've heard people talk about, you know, after giving birth, they're like, God, you know, I feel for my mom now so much like she did whatever, whatever. And then I hear the other side where people are like, God, you know what? My parents were, didn't do a great job. And now being a parent, I feel like, why couldn't you have just done these simple things? Like that also happens, right? You're like, you know, So I think it goes both ways where it can be like, you know, you understand, but then you also don't understand. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think that's also something to be prepared for. Yeah. You know, is like, yeah, your relationships with people, you know, in your life that were around during your childhood is going to change too. Yeah. It's going to change a lot. And now before you didn't need your family members as in a, in like a practical sense, but once you have a kid, you kind of might, right. You might need them for babysitting. Yeah. Or you might, you might've had a really hard birth and your healing process. Like you're like in bed for mm-hmm. a week or two, whatever, you know yeah. what I mean? So you might actually need them. So that also changes is that dynamic of like not having needed them right? and now needing them again. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Things cycle back in some ways. Right? It's true. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Your whole world. But then it's also really awesome because then, you know, the universe has made babies so freaking cute. And they smell so delicious that you're like, fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. I'll keep doing all of this. Yeah. I'll jump in yeah. because you're just so darn cute. You know, it's, it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. yeah. Well, Serena, this has just been lovely. I know. Thank you so much. Thank you for making the time to chat with us and, um, Everybody out there, you can look into what Serena is doing, see how you can support it or or avail yourself of it. And um, we'll see you next time on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Take care. Hi, listeners. This is Sarah Trott with a quick message to let you know that Serena has offered listeners of Fourth Trimester Podcast a discount of 10% on their purchases on her site, which is monumentalsf.com. And you can also find the code on our website, which is fourth trimester podcast.com. The code to use is for the number four, try T R I mom, M O M four try mom. Check it out. Bye-bye. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know.
know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town with. You got your pedals, you got your brakes. You always wear your helmet for safety's sake. Song, I sing a song for you.